Howdy, howdy, howdy. What's up, people? It's tea time because we're still in England. And it's the evening, so I don't drink coffee after 6 p.m. or so. It's 6.30. Tea, tea, half the caffeine hit of coffee and still picks you up a little bit. And it's kind of pleasant. Doesn't mess with your belly. <clears throat> I'm all about it. I like it. I'm an English breakfast or Earl Grey kind of guy. Just the basics, please. Yorkshire tea. Good stuff. Good stuff. What's happening out there? Everybody good? This is my last Sunday live from the road. After this, I'll be back in my studio next week. And it's been great over here, but I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to getting home. It's that time. You know, when you're like, all right, time for some home time. What do we got going on here? We got Oregon in the house. We got Ben here. What's up, Ben? How you doing? Uh, ben says he switched from coffee a few months ago and his stomach thanks you. I still got to do coffee. Uh, I mean, it's not like I haven't had two coffees today. I have, but then I do tea <laughs> later in the day. I can do like two coffees and three teas. And like, that's much easier than three coffees in a day on my belly. Uh, I drink a lot of caffeine. I'm just the caffeine kind of guy. I like it. What can I say? I like that speedy feeling. Is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. I drink tea on the show now. Like, I mean, I do the first set. We do two sets in this band. Break in the middle. About an hour and 20 each set. I'm like, an hour and 15 each set. And uh, I drink tea on the first set. And then I have, like, a beer or a cider, the second set, or a glass of wine. Always beverages. Always. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Mr. Willis says he enjoyed the fire station gig. That's cool. That was a neat venue. Uh, the fire station in what the heck was that? I can't remember where it was now. I'm not going to remember the name of it, but I remember the venue. I remember the town. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what else happened this week? I don't know. We got a so tomorrow we're in Dartford, which is basically kind of just outside London. And then we play at one more London show. Kettling Hall, and uh, which is kind of Kensington, Sloan Square. Um, and then I head to a, a hotel and head home the next day. That's it. That's it. That's it. Lauren says, home, it's where all your stuff is. Yeah, true, true, true. Exactly. Uh, William says, I bet you're excited to be off the road. Yeah, excited to see the cat and stuff. You know, Let's get home and watch some TV programs and make myself food at home and all that stuff that you just can't do while you're out on the road. You know, you know, one of the things on the road that not to, to, uh, to whinge, but one of the things that drives me crazy is the constant packing and unpacking every day. <laughs> this, it seems simple, but it's like the suitcase thing. It's just like, I have to unzip this thing and pull things out and then do it again tomorrow and put things back. It's so dumb, but it's like after 60 days of that, you're just like, I can't pack and unpack anymore because you're never in the same place for two days. Very rarely. Like it's always, it's every day you're moving, 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 moving. So that pack and unpack thing is insane every day. <laughs> and uh, laundry it felt good yesterday. I did my final laundry of the tour and uh, I was like, great. I'll have to do that again. Find the washing machine and all that, you know, where am I going to do my laundry this week? It's the crazy little stuff. It, it, what people say about the road is true. I mean, I love being out and, you know, traveling. You'd see cool stuff and go places, you know. But it's true that uh, when you hear it's a it's a kind of a almost like a uh, a cliche. But folks say that the two hours on stage is brilliant. And then it's the other 22 hours of the day or whatever that are just like where they don't want to be on tour or whatever. There's a lot of truth to that where it's like the and that's just the stuff I'm talking about, the packing, unpacking, the. You know, so where am I going to do my laundry? How am I going to do this? All that kind of stuff just ends up after a little while. You're just like, all right, and, you know, need some home time, you know. But that said, we've had a great time. The gigs are super fun. It's always super fun. Uh, the time on stage is super fun. The people are great and stuff. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's good to always good to be working. What are you guys talking about? Let's see here. Uh, John says, just change once a week when you shower. I wouldn't recommend that, my friend. You'll be awfully gross after a day or two of gigs. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rock and Rolling says he played a uh, four-hour gig last night and fingers were fried by set three. Hardest solos of the night are in that set. Um, yeah. It's, it's funny. On this one, we're pretty ripping right now. Like, I must say, like, you know, you do enough of them and you're just like your hands are just like my hands are dialed right now i hope i can keep that going when i go home play a fair amount and stuff and um feels really good in that way so uh is there a piece of gear over here that i wish i had that i don't have that's a good question um let me see it would have been kind of fun to have my destroyer just for fun i really enjoyed playing that last year over here uh anything else not really. I love the rig this year. It's been really fun. I was thinking today, like, what would I do next year different? And I was thinking, you know, maybe I would just go uh, SL60, or sorry, uh, PT100, actually, I was thinking next year. But we might have a new amp by then. We'll see. I don't know. New new design from Sir. We'll see if we can get it done. It's already pretty late in the year, but who knows? We might have a, you know, at least a prototype or something I could take on the road. I would love that. Some variation of pt50 so we'll see uh yeah 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 <clears throat> yeah all right uh what else are you guys talking about rob is in winter pig he says hope i'm doing well you know the weather has warmed up here considerably like 10 degrees so last week around this time it was like 45 during the day now it's like 55 fahrenheit um big difference feels really good now feels like you know, I think tomorrow's supposed to be 59 or something, almost 60. Wow. It's like, ooh, it's t-shirt weather. Funny how that is. It's all relative, right? You know, back in LA, that's like, ooh, it's cold though. 59. It's cold. <laughs> Although not right now. I mean, it's it's basically the same temperature over there, I think. So there's Mark Tone Talk. What's up, man? How are you doing? Uh, questions about the new Extreme song and single. I like it. Yeah, the solo's ripping. I think he does that. He does that delay trick, like he does on his version of "Flight of the Bumblebee," right? Uh, so it just sounds like absolute ballistic speed at the end, which it is. But it's it's a little bit of a sleight of hand because I think he's using the the delay, right, for the you know the uh, the, the 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 bounce back echo thing, which is super cool. He's he's got a really articulate way of doing that with the delay that just rips. It's pretty cool, and I guess the song's doing quite well, so that's good. You know, super cool. Um, yeah, good for rock and roll music. And let's see. Oh, uh, Mr. Willis, right. Sunderland, uh, was where the fire station gig was. That's right. Sunderland. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. That's the road. Can't remember things. Yeah. Then you called the fire station. We played great restaurant in the, uh, in that venue. Had one of the better meals of the tour, uh, before a gig. You know, usually you're just kind of getting whatever because it's like before the show and stuff. And at that venue, I had some nice sea bass and stuff. That was delicious. Check out the free Neural Amp Modeler. It has amp captures and loads IR. Sounds good to me. And is compared to the Tone X. Interesting. I didn't know they had one. Wow. I'm a little behind right now. It's going to take me a minute to catch up when I get home. On stuff. I got a lot of videos and stuff to make. So Nam's right around the corner things coming for that and everything so it's a new stuff coming and all that and that sort of thing uh all right uh what else we got here let's see i'm working on a tricky fast lick that is very challenging for me how long would you recommend working on it one sitting before giving it a rest um Make sure you get it so that you know how it goes slow and that you have kind of worked out your fingering so that it's like, oh, I'm going to use my pinky for this or my third finger for this note or whatever, so that you kind of know and you've got a game plan with it. You know what I mean? And once you can do it slow, just work it with a metronome or a phrase trainer and keep working it up, working it up to speed. Paul Davids did a nice video on this once where he had a fast passage to learn quite a, you know, technically complex passage and he he worked it up over about seven days and he filmed his progress every day and i found that video really interesting so you might look for that on his channel not sure what it's called but paul david's 
is his name and uh you know search for paul david's you know fast speed practice it'll probably come up and you'll find it uh but i would uh yeah just kind of you know go at it with a metronome Paul made an interesting observation that he was almost, when he was getting close to getting it, it was almost going too fast, you know? And I've found that as well, where you're almost going past it because you're like nervous about it. It's funny, like I learned the burn solo for this tour by Richie Blackmore, and it seemed like really challenging. Now it doesn't. It's like I can play it without thinking about it, really. But it's just one of those solos where, um, I mean, it's fast, you know? So the fast picking part on the G string where you're bouncing around, it's really fast alternate picking. But it's not difficult anymore. You know, once you know it and you've worked it up, there it is, you know. And so you can get there. You just have to metronome it, take it slow. This is where, um, for me, transcribe is my friend because I can slow down things. Like even to 90% speed. It's amazing the difference between 90 and 100 in transcribe. I don't know what it corresponds to exactly. Like, you know, but the, it's just um, you can you can slow things down just enough. To where okay i can play it at that tempo and then you just can work it up kind of every day and the neat thing in a phrase trainer like transcribe is you can store the loop of the section where the fast part is and then you can just keep repeating that over and over and practice it practice it and it really generally doesn't take that long i find it i mean i guess it depends on your technical ability and stuff but it's more like memorizing the muscle movement if you've got good technique um, but you can't quite play it up to speed. You know, you're, you're just kind of memorizing the muscle movement. And then once your hand gets it and you teach it slow, the trick with this stuff is to not um, uh, make mistakes. So don't practice wrong. So in other words, don't play it and screw up and play it and screw up and play it and screw up trying to go faster than, than you can. You're just teaching yourself how to do it wrong. You know, you're, and you're actually kind of going backwards, I think, if you do that. So you have to play it slow enough that you can technically do it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, what else have we got here? Do you use any of your monitors for these shows? For a few songs. There's a few things I need to click for. Um, I wish I didn't have to wear them at all, to be honest, because I'm a big fan of just not wearing them. But um, but I do wear them on the first song, the intro of the second song, the last song of the first set, and the first song of the second set, just for clicks. Um, I can almost, my, my goal is to one of these years get through one of these sets with not needing a click at all, <laughs> or not needing a, yeah, I don't want to hear the click, or I don't want to hear the, uh, the, uh, have, have to use the in-ears, you know, because I love not using them. I just, I just like it better. I like it better. If, um, I, I'll, I will wear them, you know, if I have to. And on certain tours, if I have to wear them for the entire gig, that's fine, you know. But if I don't have to, that's always generally my preference. And that's what I enjoy. So four songs, I guess, on this tour. Uh, huh. uh, Kevin says I can borrow his band at 75. Or maybe he's saying that to someone else. I remember those. Let's see. Have you tried Thomas McRocklin's new DSP? Is that a plugin? It's called Polychrome DSP. No, I have not. I haven't tried much because I've been out here. So um, I was supposed to put out a video this week for the Amped 2. That's been the only sort of new piece of gear I've tried in a while, uh, the Blackstar Amped 2. But then they asked me to put it out next week. So I'll, that'll be coming during this coming week. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically ready to go. Um, but yeah, I'm a little behind. You know, it's going to be going back to LA and getting back into making videos and gear and stuff like that. So we'll be doing for a while until I tour again in the summer. Uh, do you double up a dirty channel on the amp and use it with the Archer or stack with a drive? Well, I, so I don't, on this tour, uh, I'm SL68, so it's plexi style amp. So it's just a single channel that I'm turning up and it's getting distorted like an old Marshall. But then I do hit it with the Archer for solos, yeah. I hit it with a boost too for a couple things. These uh, either the Unit sixty seven or the uh, the Zio from 
source audio, depending on, you know, a couple of things that just hits the front end of the amp and saturates it a bit more, or for leads, it's generally the archer. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Been looking for a plexi style amp says Rick eyeballing SL 68 or 67 BE 50 or Marshall handwire super lead for studio use only. Um, well, the BE50 is a much more modern amp, but it'll get you, you know, plexi sounds, but you're going to be able to get more gain out of that one than anything else you mentioned because it's got the gain boost in front of plexi sort of architecture. Uh, I believe B50 has a clean of some sort too, right? So, so you're talking about a more versatile modern amp that's also got an effect loop built in and stuff. So if you want to patch in post effects and stuff, you know, you're able to do that with that. It's a versatile modern kind of affair, not dissimilar to say a PT100 or something. Uh, Marshall Handbart, pretty good, is generally the consensus. I mean, when you talk to people about it, um, certainly, you know, with a couple tweaks could probably be modded into anything. I mean, they're very nice, you know, the way they're done. Um, I think somebody like Friedman would tell you he's probably not sure about the transformers, you know, but they work. They're okay. They're just like maybe not, you know, his favorite or, but he's an amp builder. So he's got other things that he likes and stuff. Um, but there's nothing, you know, if you got one for a steel, it's a good amp. I think, you know, they're, they're a base, they're a hand wired plexi, you know, uh, that can be, you know, tweaked or massaged or different values done different things too. So it's a cool amp. When we get into the 67 and the 68, uh, the addition of the dual tap power transformer that gives you 90 or 120 volts is a big deal, I think, because it allows you to get that sag. It's almost like having a half power switch, but of course, it's switching the voltage on the whole amp, a la Eddie Van Halen Variac things. You're able to get that Van Halen thing. Uh, you know, it's got a great feel to it. And to to be honest, I, I almost never use my SL68 in 120 volt mold it's it, it's always in the 90 volt the low voltage uh i love it it's just got a feel and a, that's how i like that amp i mean it it's 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 not a huge difference between 90 and 120 i wouldn't say it's not like adding a gain boost or uh, you know or whatever but it does lower the volume a couple db and it gets a little bit more the sweet sag thing that is really fun you know that's just become something that i'm very used to and enjoy with that amp so um so if that's something that you want plus it's got a master on the back that's quite usable to at least lower the amp to reasonable gig volume in a club or something you know um the the type of master that's integrated on it, a post phase inverter master is really nice so you know I would say closest to old Plexi, you know, in pure circuit form, you know, the 67, the 68 or the Marshall hand wired. Uh, but the Marshall hand wired probably gets the nod there because it doesn't even have, it's just the straight up, it's a straight up, you know, Plexi style Marshall or whatever. 67 or the 68, they've got the added versatility of the, the 90 or 120 uh, mode. And then the BE50, much more modern take with effect loop clean channel you know you'll be able to get more gain out of it because of the the added gain of the uh, the gain boost in front da, 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 da. so just look at what you want hopefully you can try before you buy four great amps though i would say you know do i remember if even tied micro pitch delays are only in parallel uh i think so i think on an even hmm. Dude, I don't remember. I mean, if you can get both of them up the middle, you mean? I mean, even e the, the delays. Yeah, I don't remember. You're saying, are they hard panned like left and right? Uh, the, because you can actually do delay with a micro pitch pedal. I think maybe they are like discrete to the left and right channel, but I'm not 100% sure. You'd have to, that'd be a, you have to kind of look in the manual or probably hit up even tight and ask. I just don't remember right now. If I had one in here, I could check. Not 100% sure about that. My guess is yes, that the delays are, you know, left and right sort of. Uh, the Vintage Revolution, I know about this box. I had one of these. I still have one of these. Uh, can it do dual delay? Well, I don't remember that, but <laughs> it's been 10 years since I've tried it, but it appears to be available in Europe. 
Is it? That's interesting. I would have thought that it, he wasn't around anymore, but maybe he is, and he's still out there making them. Um, it's a really, this is a really cool two rack space effect unit that um, came out a while back that I made a video for that is all analog. So it's programmable, MIDI switches and everything, and it's got delay, EQ, flange, chorus, time-based stuff, you know, no reverb because it's analog. Um, but it's a great sounding thing. It's just a little kind of, you know, I guess niche would be the word. I don't remember if it does dual delay, to be honest, or if it's got one kind of tap analog delay. My guess, once again, I'm guessing, my guess is yes, but watch my video on it because I did a video on it and there might be something I did and there were two delays. I don't remember. There's, I probably did something in the video where I I showed the delay. I mean, that was literally two studios ago and 10 years, you know, so it's it's been a minute uh, since I made that video and I just don't recall what's exactly in the video myself, but... Um, give it a give it a listen and see what you can find uh it is a cool unit though and i do like it how often do you go through a set of tubes on your touring apps well you know what's funny is the tubes can go at any time or never you know they're so i mean when i got out here the very i i got the uh, sir does a thing where on their amps they measure a couple different readings on tubes and then they write in silver pan on the base of the tubes and also on the top of the tube these numbers and it's very, very, very handy because if you've got those numbers, you can then get another set of tubes that have the same or close readings that, that are matched and drop them right in the amp without having to rebias, right? Because they're, they're very similar ratings. Um, so when I was coming over here, I was using a Bella. That, uh, there's a Bella that lives here in England, and they said I could use it. And uh, so I went, great. And I, I was like thinking... I should probably get a spare set of tubes for that amp because I've got a spare set for the SL68 too. So I was like, to spare. So um, I, I had them get the numbers for the tubes that are in this Bella that was in England. And at the factory in Lake Elsinore, they matched up a set that would match perfectly with those. Brought the tubes over here, plugged in the amp, and day one, the amp had a low hum you know, through the speaker that and I was like, uh, I know what that is. And I hit one of the power tubes and it went away. And so it's like, okay, one of the power tubes is intermittent and doing a weird thing. So there you go. You know, it's like, you never know. It's like day one, I fired up the thing and the tube was weird. It was a set of JJ's and they had met, they had done a set of uh, 5881, uh, the soft text, you know, that they had around that matched the same. I said, great. I popped them in. That's what I've been using all tour. So you never know, you know, and that's the thing with tubes, why it's always good to have spares around and they might last you, you know, you might be good for 10 years. You might be good for two days. Luckily with a tube like the 5881, those are super reliable. Uh, JJ's can be super reliable. They can last forever. And then it's like, it seems to be the thing with JJ that uh, you'll, you'll get, you know, tubes that'll last for a long, long time, long, long time. Everything's reliable. Everything's great. Everything's great. Then, whoa, what happened? all the AL 34s or half of them are starting to fail, you know, where they just get inconsistent and things. And that's just them, you know, it's weird. That doesn't really happen with those Sovtech 5881s. They seem like they're really, and they were a tube that a lot of people use for a lot of years in their amps uh, because they're so reliable. Um, so it's, it's tubes are a crap shoot, you know, it's not like the old days. I mean, even in the old days, they used to be kind of unreliable. I think, I think a lot of the, uh, the uh, uh, the Mullards and everything that everybody talks about. I mean, I've had you know match sets of Mullards that I've gotten from people and stuff, and they fail uh, after you know six months and stuff. I remember Fred from Divided by Thirteen going, "Oh yeah, you know those Mullards that everybody talks about, and now they <laughs> and they used to fail all the time and stuff." So I don't know, you know. Uh, Bab says, who are you playing with? I'm playing with a group over here called Classic Rock Show that's based in the UK out of Liverpool, and we play all kinds of stuff. Zeppelin and the Who. And, and here's a here's a question leading into that. Would you consider playing any old metal on the Classic Rock Show, like Maiden, Priest, Metallica? You know, I think it would be cool to do like a... Yeah, to do a portion of sets where you do that kind of thing. You know, where you go into like a three song, you know, uh, second wave of British heavy metal thing or something. Or, um, 
you know, so, so, something along those lines so that might be like a little, you know, this is a problem out here because it's like, what, we say this every day and it's always the argument, what is classic rock? Um, you know, to us in the US, the pretenders, the police you know, are classic rock, right? Roxanne gets played on classic rock radio every day. I'm told over here, the police aren't really considered classic rock. And that if you we were to play a police song, you'd have guys in the audience in white snake or thin Lizzie t-shirts going, what the hell is this? You know, why are they doing this? In the States, it would be much more, you know, accepted that that would be a classic rock song, you know, say Message in a Bottle or Roxanne or something. Um, so it's just regionally, I think it really depends where you are, you know. Over here, I think you're safe playing uh, Thin Lizzy, ACDC, Led Zeppelin, Status Quo, uh, you know, these kinds of bands. Um absolutely no question you know probably gary moore rainbow deep purple uh now you might play rainbow in the states and people would be like what the hell is this song right you know they wouldn't know or even thin lizzie you know you could play the rocker and people would be like this is a cool song but i don't know who did it you know um so it's 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 really hard to say so if we were to play maiden and priest would there be people in the audience that would be like this is heavy metal you know and certainly Metallica. This is thrash, you know. It's hard to say, you know. Uh, I I think it would be cool to incorporate a little bit more later, to, like getting into the 90s. Like, I wouldn't be at all afraid to do some Get Alice in Chains or Soundgarden, you know, or maybe a Pearl Jam song or something like that, and do maybe a trio of those kinds of tunes, you know, uh, or something. You know, but these are discussions that we have, you know, and it you start to realize that the audience is, gets older and older and older, too. And that if you want to maybe expand your audience a bit and get a few younger people in, because it's great. I mean, I love playing for older people. And sometimes the crowds are mixed anywhere from little kids all the way up to grandparents, you know, at these shows. But if all we do is stuff that's pre-1980, eventually you're going to end up with older and older and older and older folks and people at this point you know nirvana is classic rock of you know it gets played on classic rock radio right so um and i don't i don't think actually anybody would complain if we did some a cool you know an alice in chains song or a uh a, a sound garden song you know i think we should do black hole sun or something like that's i mean especially since i played with chris and there's a little bit of a story there so that would be nice to do at some point you know because it's an epic 90s song that's like um, a, a classic hit. And it's definitely classic rock at this point. So, you know, uh, I would love to do that, you know, in the context of this show. Uh, okay, the, I got super chats I got to grab there. So I'm looking for those. I'm, I haven't forgotten about you guys. I will get those in just a sec. Mel, um, talk about acoustic, uh, acoustic TX on your studio sorry i don't know what that means mel talk about what acoustic tx works for you on your studio maybe you can phrase that differently i'm just not sure what what the question is uh david what drum software do you use to make your pedal demos uh, i often use different things but for the most part it's easy drummer or superior drummer three from tune track i love those those are the ones you hear the most often on my stuff any thoughts on the new Mesa Mark 7? You planning on trying one out? I would be happy to, actually. I'm making amp videos now. So, um, you know, I don't know if they would be interested in having me do one, but I'd be happy to, actually. It would be cool, you know. Uh, yeah, do I think the new PT50 will have charity Q for channels 2 and 3? Um, yeah, but there will be uh, probably some switchable voicing stuff where you'll be able to voice the, the channels. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, gains and brights and things like that to switch things up a little bit. But, yeah, I don't want to have a necessarily a independent EQ stack. That's a lot of knobs on an amp for having, if you're getting into three channels, you know. It starts to look like those Marshalls that have, like, two rows of knobs that get really crazy, you know. It's a lot to navigate to me. Uh, any stuff from Nam you can give hints on? Just cool new effects. I can't really say what, but I know about some cool new effects. I know about some cool new amp stuff. Um, uh, cool new preamp stuff that's exciting and cool and helpful. And yeah, so there'll be some neat stuff coming this year, actually, from around that time. Uh, have you ever toured one of Axe Effects only 
as a post effects into a real tube amp. Yeah, I toured with an Axe effects with Melissa Etheridge, just DI actually. I used the Axe for a European tour once. And then I also used the Axe kind of like Ty Tabor used it, where I went into a cabinet on stage with uh, a tube power amp powering the cab and then i also had the irs out of the axe feeding the pa i did a whole melissa etheridge run like that and that worked great too it was good uh are all 2023 dates of classic rock show in the uk well so far i don't know if they'll book anything else this year they they always talk about doing europe and the u.s and stuff but i'm not sure but i know they really want to so the, the, there's there's a good chance that that'll happen i just don't know if that'll be in 2023 or next year or what they do uh so okay uh i'm just uh trying to find those super chats so guys i'm gonna page down through comments here a lot i'm sorry i'm missing a whole bunch because there's quite a few people online uh 350 almost we've got uh there's robin it was great to see status quo song in the set are they a band you heard much about in the past you know growing up in canada um i mean i knew of them not like you would here in the UK, though. It was kind of a UK-Europe thing, I think, really. But because my sister always used to buy Kerrang! magazine religiously, I used to see them in there. So from the time I was like 10 or 11 years old, I was like, who's this band status quo? You know? Status quo, status quo. How do you say it? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so I was aware of them, you know, and then was, I was like, that's a cool rock band. They're up there with Marshalls and Tallies and stuff. At least it looks cool, you know. Um, but you play them here and people go nuts. It's fun, you know. I like playing the song that we do. We do a song called Down Down. Our seventh's really fun. Richard asks, thank you for the super chat as well. Richard says, would using the power station with the PT-15 effectively give the amp more headroom? Yeah, I mean, that's one thing about the power. Power station is a load reamp from Fryette, right, that allows you to load your amp all the way down to line level, and then it's got a built-in 50-watt tube amp. So essentially what you're doing is you've now got a 50 watts to play with. So whether it's a five watt amp you're plugging into it or a hundred watt amp you're plugging into it and you're getting a little less power, um, you've got a 50 watt tube amp there for reamp that's quite clean and linear and allows you to, to turn up your amp uh, to whatever level you would like. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh Here's this question again from Mel. I don't understand the question, my friend. Acoustic TX. What does TX mean? <laughs> Sorry, I have no idea. <laughs> are you talking about acoustic guitar? Or are, are we talking about acoustic panels? I think you're talking about maybe acoustic panels. But I don't know what TX means. Um uh, if we're talking about acoustic panels in in my studio, I use um, uh, some made panels that were made for me specifically three studios ago, and then I've just taken them to different studios basically, and they work fine. Um, they're uh, uh, you know, I've got a cloud above my desk that's super thick with padded stuff and hanging at an angle, and then I've got panels on my walls that were custom made that are absorbing absorbing but also have sort of multi layers of different wood pieces on them you see them in my videos um and they're all at different angles so they kind of break up sound waves actually and they absorb below 350 hertz or something so it's supposed to absorb bass and then deflect above that but well kind of diffusing and then the the panels in my corners are bass traps big old bass traps that have open backs and they they go so if you've got a corner of a of a room the panel goes flat against the, the walls in the corner. There's an air gap behind. And then the base goes back there and never comes out because the back of that panel is open with stuff that looks like kind of like insulation on the back. Uh, and it, it sucks up all the base, you know, going into the corners. It works quite well. I feel like I can mix in my room, no problem. Sounds pretty good. Uh, Neil says, uh, great to meet you last night at the Lighthouse Awesome Set. Thanks, man. Uh, looking forward to catching Classic Rock Show next year. Please come back. Please come see us again. We have so much fun, as you saw, I think. Looks like I'm having a good time up there, right? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Would using the power station with the PT-15 effectively give the amp more headroom? Oh, I got that one already. Yes. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, what do I about, think about the Friedman Buxom? I think you're talking about Buxom Betty. 
um, on bass guitar, already using the Golden Pearl with bass in front of a 1970 Marshall Major. Well, a Buxom Betty is probably 50 watts, I think. I don't think they're super powerful. I mean, it'll probably work okay as a bass amp. Uh, you know, it'll sound similar to, uh, I think they're 40 or 50. Um, you're not going to be able to get a loud, loud, clean SVT out of it, but it'll, it'll, it'll probably work okay on bass. My question is always like the EQ is like, um, you know, the, the EQ of uh, frequencies are going to be set at guitar frequencies, kind of, you know, so it's not necessarily dialed in for great bass tone, you know, but if you set the EQ kind of flat and maybe scoop your tone or do whatever a different way, you know, it might sound just fine for a bass amp. I mean, you know, it's interesting because it wasn't a basement originally, like for bass, <laughs> you know, Fender basement, a 410 open back, right? You know, it's kind of crazy. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I really don't know because I've never tried, but uh, it would probably be similar to plugging into a, you know, some sort of mid 60s Fender and using it for bass guitar. But, uh, you know, if you plug into a closed back, you're going to be better off than, than using an open back. Uh, it just shifts everything lower and a little more defined and stuff, you know, with a bass guitar. Anza Johns, uh, is the SL68 a good clean pedal amp as well as Raging Rock amp looking for another gigging head? I mean, I think it is, yeah. Especially, you know, if you've got... Mine now has a, a switch that allows me to switch bright caps on it on the high treble input. So um, if you've got that on it, which is an easy mod, if you've got... I mean, you know, I don't want to say go and mod your SL68, but it's so bonehead simple that an amp tech should be able to do it or... You know, maybe if you ask nice uh, at Sir, maybe they do it for you or whatever. But it's just, it just gives you the option of having. Um, if uh, many times pedals play better with an amp with no bright cap, uh, the bright is a major component of the Marshall sound to me. So I'm really enjoying having it now on my SL68. I use it on almost all the time with the amp on like seven or eight on the volume, you know, seven and a half, and it sounds like a great killer raging Marshall crunch sound. And then. Uh, I can roll down the volume for semi-clean, you know, on my guitar. And that works great. Now, it, does it work good with pedals? Yeah, it does. Certain pedals, you know. But if you want a cleaner sort of martially sound, if I, if I was to turn that volume down to five and that bright cap was in there, uh, and then I was to, you know, add certain pedals in front, it might be like, uh, it's not like ice pick or, or like, you know, like a swarm of, of bees. But if you switch the bright cap off, magically works with most fuzzes then or distortion boxes. And that's just the action of the, it's the thing with a bright right now you'll often see like paul gilbert use a plexi style amp but he's going into the normal input very very neutral sounding a marshall on the normal input not my favorite sound works okay with single coils but it's pretty dark for me um that said you can jumper and then blend in you can run the normal channel in like three or four and then bring in the bright input just a little bit with the, the jumper cable going between the you know what i'm saying right on an old four hole marshall so you can use both channels and blend you can bring in the bright just a little bit and then it adds the sparkle that you kind of miss if you're just using the top right input you know so there's a lot of options on a plexi there then depending on the pedals you're using and if you're using a tube screamer or an SD1, it sounds fine going into the amp kind of no matter what to me. If you're using a certain fuzzes or uh, a certain distortions that have a lot of top end in them, then that's where you get the rasp when there's a bright cap involved on the amp and where you need to maybe try the other input and then it kind of magically works, you know? So uh, uh, long story short, yeah, I think I think uh, if if you experiment you can out of a four hole plexi there's so much depending on the input you're using there you can get kind of a good sound with pedals no matter what you know and the the, the normal channel is quite clean you know on those they just don't have the the push or the gain going through the i find i mean that that the, the high treble input does it's i mean they'll start to distort it four or five but it's a it's a, it's a mellow dark sound kind of you know and uh, you know, fairly dynamic with the volume on the guitar, that's for sure. So there's lots of options there in, a, in an amp like that. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, William says he's still got the same tubes uh, in his JVM that he bought in 2007. Still kicking. Cool. I mean, if you've got a ton of hours on them, might not if you know a tech with a tube tester might be good to take and see how close they are in spec you know because sometimes they can drift really far after 
15 years of use or something. Uh, but if it's working, it's working. If it sounds good to you, great. You don't need to. Most guys I know now, like Sir and Friedman and those guys are like, if it's working, don't change it. You know, um, you, you never know because the, the the amp could be, you know, soft in the bass now or softer than it used to be or something or little things that can happen where you, you're you just not noticing uh you know, and then you retube it and you're like, oh, wow. It's like it was kind of, I, I had an amp once that kind of didn't sound, it was my top hat, I remember, and it kind of was sounding underwhelming or something. And then I changed the tubes. I think it was my top hat, my Implexador. And then I changed the tubes and I changed the phase inverter when I did it. And that one, it was like, oh my God, that sounds better. Like it was so much more, um, it, it was just sounding kind of weak. And when I changed the phase inverter, it was like, that sounds bitching now, like so much richer and like just more authority. So, and that's kind of a part of the, the power amp. Like sometimes I wonder if the 12 AX7 that's in the phase inverter slot is cause you, you know, in an old Plexi, if you drive it up hard, that tube's getting nailed and getting driven pretty hard. And sometimes I wonder if it, they go to, you know, so you've got your three preamp tubes in a Plexi. If that one, you know, I think people generally say that when you change your power tubes, you should maybe change that one. I don't know. I'd have to ask, you know, if there was a tech here we could ask. But I did notice on that one amp a big difference when I changed out the phase inverter. It's not like the amp was noisy or failing or anything, but it just was a little underwhelming. And then when I changed that phase inverter too, it really like came to life. And I was like, oh, okay. Stuff to think about, stuff to consider. Okay, what's the best least expensive monitor speakers where I can use my UA aux as simply an amp uh, without having dedicated external speaker cabinet? Uh, so you want to run your amp into your aux and then plug into a, a, a little monitor, right? I, I, I would probably use something along the lines of... Um, uh, a fairly there's a lot of studio monitors out there that you could look at i mean the yamaha stuff is great in the kind of like 300 dollar price range you know the yamaha monitors that have like five inch drivers and a, their their line of studio monitors i think sound really quite good um i would say what else uh i love the atoms the, those are some of my favorites um the t5s i think they're called i could be wrong about the name but the they're also in the sort of three to four hundred dollar price range per speaker um, so it's like 600 for a pair. Um, yeah, with something like an aux, you probably want to get a pair because you're going to like, you, then you can really take advantage of the stereo effects, add a little bit of stereo verb and the delay and be like, sound really great. You know, you can just plug your aux right into those and they're powered. So it'll, it'll work good as a, as a way to, to kind of reamp your amp and play at home and stuff and enjoy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's my, yeah, I would look at Yamaha's and, and, and Adams. There's other stuff too. People like K, like the K rocks. And, um, are you pre precious about the condition of your guitars on tour? Um, I wouldn't say I'm precious. No, I, I do like guitars to be set up well. So when truss rods get out of whack or when the intonation's weird, you know, I like to stay on top of that stuff, but I'm not like, they're, they're my tools and I try and, you know, I'm not a good, I don't abuse my guitars, but I, I'm not, um, they're, they're my tools, you know, they're meant to be, if something gets bumped or knocked or nicked or something, that's just kind of how it goes on the road. Sometimes things happen. Uh, you know, it's, it's just part of how it is out here. So, um, you know, they're getting taken in and out, in and out, in and out every day. And then you're running around on stage with them and there's a crazy bass player with a shirt always off. that's jumping around and, you know, flying off the drum riser at you. That's Wayne Banks. And uh, you just never know. So uh, things might happen in the heat of battle. Uh, okay. What else have we got here? Uh, let's see. EO34 Quartet says, have a set of tubes in a 6100 from 92. Still perfect. Any EO34 Quartet? Actually, they could be 5881s, didn't they? use those sometime around the time of that amplifier i think they might have but uh, it's probably el 34s so yeah i mean if they work great you know i would look at them that's all that's all i'm saying is just you know if they sound great great maybe just if there's a, somebody with a tube tester so you can make sure you know one isn't super weak and you're like you know 
one side of the amps making like way more power than the other one or whatever, you know, the two outside work together and then the two inside, or, you know what I mean? Like the, however that, that, that sometimes I've just like come back from tours and stuff and I've been like, yeah, amp work great. Sounds good. And then they'll, they'll look at my tubes and go, Whoa, like this one's yeah, you definitely used it. This one's way out of whack. So we're going to give you some new tubes. I, t I tend to take them to Sir and have them look at them when I'm, when I get back. And, uh, sometimes they're just fine. You know, it's, it just depends. Um, uh, yeah yep 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 yell 34 quartet also says that he had bad luck recently with two sets of jj's yeah they they're uh they seem to be the most you know i must say uh inconsistent lately of all the uh the the, the jj stuff seems really up and down you know uh, which is i'm not trying to i don't want to bag on them i mean i like jj tubes we use the one that's not up and down is the the 6v6 that goes in they make a great 6v that goes in the pt15 um those work great you know but certain you know their el 34 is a number of years ago started becoming really unreliable to the point where uh we, we sort of switched to eh because they sound good and they were just so much more reliable so uh did i get a fix for floaters no i still got my floaters i can see them right now floating all over the screen this is the things in my eyes that float around that that we all get when you get older i've got a lot of them uh yeah this time i thought the band was from the u.s september fire says so you are an import to support the band yeah i am an import i am the import i'm the guy on the work visa over here uh they let me into the uk to do a little bit of rock and then they send me home uh uh-huh uh-huh uh let's see so i'm pretty far down in the chat because you guys are i can see the talk here about the modern rock versus classic rock versus punk rock versus uh see here the police is post-punk yeah i mean the police you know the thing about this argument with the different bands and then i'll move down to the bottom because i'm so far behind the chat but the thing about um the police to me were the police. They didn't sound like anybody else. You know, same as the Pretenders, same as Prince, same as Van Halen. Nobody sounded like Van Halen. Nobody did Happy Trails as well as, you know, Big Bad Bill, as well as um, Hot for Teacher, you know, as well, you know, and Swang like that, as well as, you know, cool takes on covers like You're No Good or, you know what I mean? I guess Van Halen with Sammy became a little more like a more typical rock band song writing wise and stuff like that. But um, you know what I'm talking about? Nobody sounded like them. Uh, nobody even sounded like Black, Black Sabbath. You know, they had their own sound. Uh, Thin Lizzy, you know, Whiskey in the Jar. I mean, the way that they did that, it was almost kind of like, a, you know, and it ended up being really brilliant. Or um, I guess that like the more typical 70s rock sound would be when if I have to come up with like, okay, it's ACDC, it's White Snake, it's you know, like like that kind of sound. Two guitar attack, solo is gonna happen for sure, you know, that kind of thing, right? Like that kind of a little bit more not and not that there's anything wrong with that, but but there's a lot of bands that had such a distinctive sound. Not that ACDC didn't. They did. You know it's them when you hear them. But you know what I'm talking about. The two guitar, guitar solo, mid-tempo to kind of fast tempo. To the, There's not a lot of ballads going on or anything like that. I guess with Whitesnake there was a few. But you know what I mean. That formula, you know. And the police wasn't that. But yet, Message in a Bottle and uh, uh, Can't Stand Losing You and... Uh, you know, certainly Roxanne. I mean, these are the songs that get played on U.S. I'm just saying being in the U.S., U.S. and Canadian classic rock radio all the time. Every day those songs get played on on those radio stations. So you can call it post-punk, but it's part of classic rock playlist, you know, in, in the United States. And that might seem odd. And I've come to realize that that might seem odd in other parts of the world. It just is what it is. To me, they were just so different you know i mean somebody's mentioned here the clash i mean to me the the clash is sort of a would the clash be a post-punk band i don't know the clash had their own thing too where they're you know drawing from different influences where it was so yeah yeah the scorpions is more like a rock meets metal band or something definitely a rock band in the 70s you know uh 
and then they all got you know i guess you know a lot of them got a little harder you know in the in the 80s or i guess the scorpions was never really i mean people might have called it heavy metal but to me when i listen to it now it's hard it's hard rock music you know it's rock hard rock so uh yeah 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 ufo that's another one some people are saying ufo is a good call yeah ufo for sure that would go over here you know um Michael says concrete blonde covered thin Lizzie. Thin Lizzie was a deep band. Phil was a pretty deep. I mean, there was the more typical rock lyrics that he wrote and stuff, but he was also quite a poet. And um, if you haven't seen his documentary that came out a year or two ago, maybe it's two years now. I can't remember what it's on. It, forget. But if you look it up, you'll you know look look on the documentary for Phil. Um, look for it uh, i thought it was great it was all about him and kind of his upbringing and what formed his sort of songwriting sensibility and just how how hardy he kind of had it as a kid and i just found it really 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 fascinating and it made me appreciate him more as a songwriter actually so it was a deep dude um uh september fire uh i saw eric johnson at the rialto theater in tucson arizona's acoustic set is cool he's awesome thanks for the super chat man yeah eric's a brilliant and and a one of a kind you know and was a pretty big influence on me formative influence for sure you know avia musicom i think is one of the greatest uh, guitar records made uh even though it's not just purely instrumental it's got some great i mean i love i was talking about this with somebody the other day for a guitar player you know he's got songs like desert rose on there which is just a it's a beautiful vocal song too, you know? Uh, and I, I love that music, you know, just something about it. It's a, it's a very, it's not a, when I listen to that record, I'm not, you know, oh, oh, technique, you know, we're like, oh, he's playing fast. I was just like drawn into the songs, you know? And that had, what was the song for George? That's got that beautiful acoustic song on it too. It's just really soulful record for, for, uh, and it sounds beautiful. It's got, the drums are pretty bright and processed and all that, you know, for the, it's, that era coming out of the 80s <laughs> you know for sure uh and it still has a little bit of that production but the guitar sounds are like magical um let's see official mariano says i have two plexi and slp 100 and 87 x i have a saturation problem with the effects loop saturation and the delays reverbs okay well the thing about your amps dude is that they um it's it's a hard amp to put an effects loop in um, because of the, it's why Sir doesn't actually do it and why uh, Friedman doesn't really like effects loops in plexis. And it's because of the way that they kind of, the, 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 the way the circuit is. A big part of the sound of those amplifiers is, I believe, is nailing the, the power section. And that doesn't mean just the power tubes, it means the phase inverter, the place the loop comes in the circuit. Um, and the way the gain kind of moves through the circuit. Once again, I'm not a tech, but it makes sense to me. The way that the, the amp is set up in the preamp makes it difficult to get that martial tone, that plexi sort of or super lead sort of sound at the gain level you want without distorting the power amp. Phase inverter, for sure. And then whatever, you know, to some degree, the power tubes and stuff. Um, there's just no other way to put it it's a little like an ac30 big part of the magic happens when you're turning it up and you're like yeah there's the magic now if you were to put a loop in where you kind of have to put a loop on an amplifier you'll find your effects get distorted i i've had a you know top hat king royale it's got effects loop in it same problem where i'd get it up to gig level and i'd set my delays and everything and it sound good at a lower volume and then i'd get the amp up to where okay now here's band volume and it'd be like why are my delays so loud oh my god you know and it, that's the problem is that it's that that saturated uh output section because the more you saturate the output section which includes the phase inverter uh the more the effects are going to jump out because they've you've run out of clean headroom there it's basically turning into a sort of harmonic distortion and compressor you know uh and and you're running in effects into that, which is making them pop out more and sound somewhat distorted. So the only answer is to do your volume reduction and effect stuff in a different way. So if you use something like, let's say, a, a power station, uh, which is a, a reamp device from 
uh, Fryette. You can put, put that after the amplifier, then you get the sound of your amp at pretty much anything from bedroom volume all the way up to super loud gig volume, and you use the effect loop on that thing, totally post-distortion and post-saturation and all that. Uh, you're getting the sound of your amplifier exactly as you want it, and you're getting your effects exactly as you want it at any volume you want them at. So it can be a great purchase, I think, for someone like you that wants to get the tone of those nice amplifiers, but without the issues that you're having and also be able to, you know, to get a nice, a nice volume going. So yeah, give that a try, you know, maybe, maybe a reamp box like the power station can be good for you. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm so far back in the chat. So I'm going to run down, look for super chats and then guys ask again, if you ask me a question, cause I got to, sorry, I get long winded. You know how I am by this point, we're five years into this. You know how I am. Tom Toms, there are the super chat. Thanks, man. Uh, just bought the Boss OD200, DD200, and MD200. Uh, but find that together, they are kind of sucking my tone. Any idea what I'm doing wrong? Let's talk about that in just two seconds here. I'm going to return a text really quickly. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to say, just doing my Sunday live show. Uh, I'm back. Okay, we're talking about Tone Suck. OD100, or sorry, OD100, uh, OD200, DD200, MD200, fine together, they're kind of sucking my tone. Hmm, well, if they're all bypassed, they shouldn't, technically. Uh, are you talking about when they're on? If you find that you're getting a bit of that happening when they're on, then you're not liking it. I mean, running them all in series, you know, you're kind of getting, a, well, OD 200, so that's the distortion. Okay. And then a DD and MD. I would, su I would suggest if you're finding tone suck in any way, shape, or form on a pedal board with three or more pedals, you know, you probably maybe want to look at a switcher. So, you know, something like the Boss uh, ES5, you know, you could use with your Boss pedal. So when you're running into the unit and then coming out of it, uh, you plug the pedals in in loops, and then they're not in line when you're not using them. You know, you can switch them in line, and then, you know, you, you, you save yourself some of that issue. The other thing you could do is use units like the DD200 and MD200 in parallel. There's a few different ways you can do that, using something like the wetter box from the Gig Rig, uh the parallelizer from music com lab is another one so these are basically units that let you plug effects into them and then you you keep your dry signal completely pure and you run the effects 100 percent wet or in kill dry mode and then you just blend them in for the effects so you're essentially using them in parallel your dry signal stays intact 100 percent, always running through you know to the amp or, you know, if you've got, but it, it really depends, Tom Toms, on how you are patching your stuff. Like if you're running them all in front of an amplifier, or maybe you have the OD200 in front of, and the DD and the MD are running in the effect loop of the amp, because it could be, the, if you're using those guys, the time-based stuff in an effect loop, you could be getting some tone suck from your effect loop. You know, if it's not buffered right, um, if you're running long cables and it's, you know, if it's not buffered right and you're getting a little bit of loss there and stuff, it's so tell us a little bit more if you want to about your rig and how you plug them in. I'll see if I can get a, a little bit more. Maybe that's some clues that I already said, you know, that you're going, oh, it could be that. But uh, to, if you tell me a little bit more about your rig, I'll see if I can get a little bit more into some answers uh, specific to you. Uh, thoughts on drama about JHS blowing up the price of the Digitech Bad Monkey after showing it sound the same as a clon. I, I mean, I, I watched that video. I don't know how close. I just watched it listening on my phone, so I don't know how accurate that's going to be. But um, the Bad Monkey was a Tube Screamer clone, as far as I remember. That was always my memory of it, was that it was kind of designed to sound like a, a screamer. And back then, it was kind of, when it came out, I remember everybody thinking, this pedal sounds pretty good. Like, basically, it sounds like a good Tube Screamer, and it's like $30. <laughs> Like, because they were really cheap when they came out. And it was sort of revered back then for being a great cheap pedal. Anybody else remember that? Like, that that's my memory of it, is everybody talking about, Bad Monkey's great for the money. You know, it was one of those. So, as far as sounding like a clon, I mean, prices of clons are insane, you know? It's like, 
that's just ridiculous. But it's kind of like a vintage. The clones are like vintage guitars at this point. It's like it's a collectible, not based on the great sound that it makes. Yes, it sounds good if you like that sound. Just like a Les Paul. Yes, it sounds good if you like that sound. Is a '59 Les Paul worth? what it's worth you know no it's just about a limited number of them being out there it became a collectible what makes things a collectible some degree of greatness or you know being revered for how they function but a lot more of it is availability and then just this je ne sais quoi of the market driving you know same as the tso 808 right you know there's some pedals that have just become very very valuable based on you know i mean an echoplex is similar uh, you know, EP2 versus EP3, you know, or, or um, you know, original Univibes, original Fuzz Faces. Can you get a new thing that sounds just as good? Probably, you know. Uh, are they, you know, everybody is, you know, the, the tone and everything? Probably, you know. But the other thing is still like 10 times the price because it just it's a collectible. So um, I, I don't think the Bad Monkey is some... Um, Thing that you have to you know lust after now or something like that just because of you know there's, there's plenty of good sounding screamer type pedals out there and plenty of good sounding clon there was great sounding i mean there was the soul food or the uh what's the other one the uh i don't know what the heck i there's so many of them i can't remember now but i did videos of some years ago that were you know clon clones that were cool uh, there's there's tons of them, man. I mean, the Rocket Archer is the one I've used for years, and it works great. The Crazy Tube Circuits Unobtainium is the one I'm using now. It, to my ears, sounds basically identical to the Archer. Um, I plug it in, and I'm like, yeah, I can get my sound. Great. You know, I've never owned an original Klon. So I don't have a hell of a lot of interest in that kind of stuff, to be honest. You know? I, I don't. You know? It's like I don't. Like, I have to have one. It's five grand. No, I'm not going to buy one for five grand. I know what they sound like. I've tried it. It's cool, but it's not like... I feel the same way about Vintage Les Pauls. I mean, if I could find a good player that was a reasonable price, you know, uh, that had maybe had a headstock repair or something, I might get one. Do I want to pay $85,000 for a gold top or, you know, 150 and up for a burst? You know, that's 150 is one that's probably beat or modified, <laughs> you know. No, I mean, I don't. I don't have any interest in spending that kind of money on stuff like that. So um, I like nice things, nice guitars, but it's, that's, you know, that's, it's just too rich for my blood, you know, and I don't, yeah. So uh, let's see. What else have we got here? Have I learned Nuno's new, everybody's talking about this Nuno solo. I like to see a lot of people fired up about it. I have not. I haven't learned it. Have any of you guys? Uh, yeah, uh, love your demo. The orange bang guitar, I remember that pedal. Uh, it's so effing heavy. <laughs> Have you used it since I bought it because of you? It is cool. Uh, it is big though. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, orange is a company not afraid to make uh, some some big pedals. Uh, no, I, I actually had to send that one back. That was one that I didn't keep. They, they asked for it back after the video. That happens. Uh, how the hell do you use a fuzz? Uh, I don't like the broken speaker sound, but I know some guys get great tones. Well, you've got your fuzz face sounds, and then you've got your big muff sounds. You know, a big muff is very smooth with the tone control set a certain way, and it, it's the Gilmore solo sound on so many things, you know? So when you think about that, it doesn't really sound like a broken speaker. It's a much richer distorted sound, right? Whereas all, some fuzzes have a much more broken speaker. I mean, the, the earliest fuzz, the, the, the was it the Maestro that, that was on uh, Satisfaction? I mean, that's a pretty gnarly guitar sound. Um, the fuzz is a fairly smooth sound turned all the way up, but then does that magic cleaning up thing when you roll the volume down on the, you know, that's a, that's a pretty amazing, you know, the cleanup thing, the Hendrix thing where the fuzz face is on, you roll the volume down and then it just wow, and all this high end comes in and it sounds like the greatest Strat pickup sounds ever, you know? Big part of the sound is that fuzz. So um, I love that stuff. So uh, the, the fuzz that I always recommend for people that don't get fuzz is the one that I actually have on my pedal board right now, um, which is the Crazy Tube Circuit Starlight because it sounds like an overdrive uh, at low gain settings. And it has a wide gain range on it. Um, 
because it's got a gain pot, but then also a switch with a range kind of setting that you can go from low to high and then the gain pot. And at low settings, it sounds, I, I use it on, uh, we play a, a, an Eagles tune in our set right now, and I use it for that because it kind of reminds me of the sound that, um, that Don Felder got. And some people think it's a fuzz on the record. Other people say, no, it's just a tweed. He says it's a tweed amp turned up all the way. Other people go, no, that's a distinctly got to be a fuzz pedal. Who knows? But I don't, I don't, I don't uh, you know, it doesn't matter. I use the Starlight to get a really, really cool close to that sound sound, you know, I think um, that, that, that sounds like a kind of a low gain fuzz that, uh, or, you know, think tweed amp turned way, way up. And it sounds really cool, I think. So uh, the pedal can also sound like a distortion, you know, depending on how you play and what pickups you're using into it and stuff. At a higher gain settings, say above noon or one o'clock with the gain range switch in the upper setting, it definitely becomes a fuzz, sounds like a fuzz. Um, it's like a more polite, I don't know polite's the word. It's like a more uh, usable, like because Big Muff, Big Muff is usable but they're a little more finicky and a little more alt rock sounding at high gain and a little more distinctively big muff, you know? Like I say, this pedal's a bit more of a chameleon, the Starlight, where it's just a cool distorted sound, but it's fat and it's thick. It's not like a Marshall in a box. It's more like a fat, thick, you know, and the more you turn it up, the fatter and thicker it gets. And it's like, you know, but it's full, maybe it's like it's fuller through the mids and not as notchy as a big muff. I don't know if notchy is the word either. I don't know. It's just... A great pedal. The Starlight. The Starlight. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, Danny says, uh, would you ever be tempted to go down the Tonex Road and just use a pedal board? Well, I've, I mean, I've done the, um, not necessarily just a pedal board, but I've done, like I say, over the years, you know, I've used a pod live back in the day. I used an Axe FX live. Uh, I've done the quad cortex live, you know, with no amps. These are all things. I mean, I did that this year. I used the, 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 uh, the quad. There's certain gigs where it just makes sense to do these things. If I ever did another gig where I was not allowed to use amps, like no cabs on stage, 100% at that point, I would just go probably with, uh, I mean, it's either going to be PT-15 at that point with my pedal board, with the IR out, or a quad cortex, you know, uh, and just go direct. Because it's like, at that point, it's like, all right, if you're going to, if I'm boxed into that corner of not being able to have a cab and stuff, the stuff out there is good enough these days that it's like, you can do your captures, you know, with, be it Kemper, be it, I mean, this is the way, by the way, most pop, things are done these days i mean most most of the touring artists you see out there that are not a loud metal band with amps on stage if it's a pop band they're using a kemper you know they just are some of the max effects uh but that's how they that's how they all roll yep we're all on kempers that's what we're gonna do come in next week and get your in-ear molds done i mean that's just how pop tours are these days so uh you know it's they they don't want to deal with shipping things or backline or any of that stuff. You know they don't they don't want to deal with the cabinets and sound on stage and none of that. So everybody uses that stuff these days on on those tours. So if that was my gig, you know, if anybody hired me ever again <laughs> to do one of those things, we'll see. You know, most of my gigs is funny. It's like I'm I don't want to say like I aged out of that stuff, but maybe I did. I don't know. My touring this year is with the band Five for Fighting. We're I'm doing a tour this summer, you guys, with Five for Fighting. If anybody's in the states, I'll be out. We're we're touring with um, uh, Delamitri and Bare Naked Ladies this summer, so I'll be out uh, uh, June and July on the last Summer on Earth tour. I do believe it's called. So I'll post some stuff on my social media about it pretty soon. But um, we are doing the back half of the tour. The first half of the tour is Delamitri, Semisonic, and Bare Naked Ladies, and the second half of the tour is Delamitri, Five for Fighting, and Bare Naked Ladies. So that'll be the where, when I'm out there. And so on that, I'm not even sure what I'm going to use yet. I'm, I'm like torn about it's. It's probably a shorter set. It's probably a 45 minute set because there's two openers and then a headliner, right? So it'll probably be 45. So I'll probably go easy, just kind of take you know maybe either PT15 and a, uh, a one cabinet and uh, and my board 
um, or I'll go quad again, like I did last year, quad cortex, a couple cabs, you know, sort of thinking that the PT 15 realm might be just the easiest, you know, way to go. Once again, John likes kind of a quiet stage and, you know, why don't I just go out with the, the 212 PT 15, nobody gets hurt. You know, if I play acoustic, I can use my pedal board and just take the, it's not going to be any fly dates or anything. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian's asking about a Pasadena Blackheart pickup. Never heard of that. What company is that from? Don't know that one. Uh, let's see. I know the Pasadena. You're talking about the Pasadena Black from... There's a pickup called the Pasadena Black. There's a Pasadena White and Pasadena Black from... Pariah. Nice pickups, that company. I like their pickups. Uh, the, the black is the hotter, kind of a uh, bit like a Frankenstein, I think is kind of what it's based on. And I liked them. I used them in my Big Eddie Big Eddie pickup roundup, if that's the one you mean. But Black Heart, I don't know that one. Watched all your board build videos. Question about time-based effects. Are they in loops or after switcher and MIDI turns off? Second, the latter. You've got it. They are in loops and uh they're not in loops and the midi turns them on and off that's right if so are they always in series yes what order delay first reverb and stuff after that so i used to have two h9s and a timeline or two h9s and a dd 500 boss delay the way i had that was all those in series and the first h9 that would do pitch i was using it mainly as a pitch shifter it's a throwback to when I used to play with Don Hanley and I would do certain things with a harmonizer. Um, so the pitch pedal came first. It was almost exclusively used for that. And I had that in true bypass mode. So when it, when it wasn't on, which was most of the time, uh, it was just bypassing through. The next pedal was the delay. Like I say, either a timeline or a DD500. I could add some echo. And the next pedal was a reverb. And that was another H9. Now, of course, H9 does more than just reverb, but I'm just saying that's mostly what I used that one for. So I used one H9 for pitch, one for verb, delay in the middle. Now, did I do other things with those pedals? Yes. Occasionally, I used Leslie or uh, a little bit of uh, 949 or H3000 style micro pitch, um, different things, you know, on those pedals uh, that you can do. But and I even delay. I some of the some things that I would do. I loved the vintage digital delay in the H9. Uh, had a really nice sound, and it it had a nice mod to it. And you could kind of filter it and do a cool thing to it. So sometimes I would use that delay instead of using the timeline. But that's it. And the main reverb sounds I would use on those pedals are the the I would use the spring, the earth reverb, the hall, and the the black hole in the H9. If people are familiar with the even that stuff. Now I just have a H90, which is like a dual style. It's like two, two H9s in one, right? And and I have the timeline on the board again for now. Yeah. There you go. Now, do you ever do parallel delay and reverb? Not, I haven't, you know? And But one of these days. I do have a parallelizer for Musicom, and one of these days, maybe I'll do a, a parallel set up with these effects depending on my amp rig and stuff because i've been wanting to do that for years because it does sound really great the, having the dry path go all the way through um is really cool you know it's just it's a great sound so uh we'll see we will see might be cool to have like you know one thing i could do to kind of get away with this is i could have now that i've got the h90 I could probably go into the first half because you know you can use the H90 as two different processors really. So I could probably use the first processor in the H90 um, in series, if because there's just certain things like rotary that I want to do sometimes that I, I can't do with parallel. Rotary, sometimes you want 100% wet thing, right? Or tremolo, sometimes you want hard on off. See, if you've got a tremolo in uh, no, in a, a parallel loop, it, you're never going to get that because you've got the dry signal running through. So these are the crazy things you run into when you do guitar effects. 
I'm trying to figure it out. But one thing I could do is I could use the front half of an H9 or one of the processors in front, and I could come out of that, then go into the parallelizer, right? And have a dry path then. It wouldn't be dry if I had the front half of that effect on, but I could use true bypass and then it would be. <laughs> and then go into the, the mixer, and then I could patch in a delay in parallel in the parallelizer and also patch in the second half of the H90. And so then I could get some mix of having all this stuff, you know. Um, but that was really boring and complicated, so I'm going to move on from that little thought. All right. This is why you guys come here, right? To hear this dribble coming out of me. All right. Modern Vintage says, if recording an amp with cabs, mics, pre's, EQs, etc., is a 10-10, what do you consider an amp and load box the best IRs to be, uh, as well as best modelers with the best IRs? If you're recording an amp with cabs, mics, pre's, EQs, etc., is a 10-10. So, so if that's 10 out of 10, the best. What do I consider an amp and load box with the best IRs to be, as well as the best modelers with the best IRs? Uh, well, if you got to go amp load box with the best IRs, I think the best way to do it for me right now is probably that my favorite load boxes out there are the Sur Reactive Load and the Fryette Power Station. A um, little bit of the nod to the Reactive Load, but the Power Station is really good too. They're both really good load boxes. So either one of those purely for the loads, right? The best IRs then I would say do in the computer because you can you can then you've got advantages if you if you want the best, you know, you can do them in the computer at full 500 millisecond length or whatever. You don't you don't have any, any if you want to do room mics and stuff, you need that extra tail, you know. So then you've got these options, you know, uh, within the computer to do impulse responses or you can use something like two notes uh, wall of sound or, uh, whatever the torpedo program is, you know, you can use that or, uh, and, and do IRs in, in the computer and, and change them after the fact and stuff like that. So that would be, I don't uh, currently out there on the market. I don't think you can get better than as far as a load box goes, the reactive load or the fry at one that's in the, their, their reamp box, which is the power station. Um, they also make a load that doesn't have the reamp built in, but I don't, I've never tried one of those actually, but it's the same load, whatever, that's in the, the power station. Uh, now, the best modeler with the best IRs. My I, my favorite modeler these days is, is uh, I, they're all good. They're, I've said this in the past, you know, it's like, what do you want? You want the Lexus or the Toyota or the, or I mean, I'm trying to pick high-end brands. Let's say BMW, Lexus, uh, Infinity and, and Mercedes and whatever. <laughs> They're all good cars that'll get you from A to B that are really nice with features and all that stuff, right? Um, it's just which one you want. My favorite personally is just been the, the quad uh, because I feel like it um, has the right combination of features for me and I love the simplicity. So that's a huge thing to me these days is ease of use. A big deal to me is not having to crack manuals and stuff like that. It's so huge. Like I don't want to, I've been tired of this age of learning curves. So the more user-friendly and intuitive it can be is a big deal to me now. And it also happens to sound great. Neural stuff sounds really good. I love the cab sims in it. Come to realize that they're like, talk about good IRs. Some of the cab sims that come in the, uh, in the neural are like better than most of the IRs that I've tried that are third party. So my favorite one for the neural, if you want to know, is the um, for a 412V sound is the uh, Greenback 90s. It's a 412 Greenback 90s cabinet. That thing sounds awesome. It's just a great Greenback sound. So you can load that up, and you can either use it with a capture or with one of the, you know, Plexi amps or the Friedman amp. You get great sound out of that thing. So that's kind of been my favorite. Do I still like the Helix and the uh, the Kemper and the Axe Fx. Yeah, I mean, they're all really good. I can get great sounds out of all those things, you know. But you're just asking me my personal fave these days. So, uh, yeah. Uh, if I want to put a humbucker in a Strat, which Thornbucker would work best? Either a Thornbucker Plus or a Thornbucker 2. The 2 is going to be slightly hotter, slightly warmer. Yeah. In a Strat. Original Thornbucker is great too. It's going to be a little bit on the low gain side though. Just know that, you know, that you're getting kind of about the output of a, of a, uh, well, 
stuff that's not a lot of pickups out there like it because it's a you know the five point or it was it eight point three or four k but with an alco four so it's kind of a unique it's maybe not quite as hot and bright sounding as a a uh, duncan 59 it's going to be sound a little more mellow than a duncan 59 you know which might match with single coils really well depending on if you're using you know just depends so yeah uh what else we got here let's see it's super chat are you back next year for crs i miss york barbican that was a venue we played the other day uh thanks to work colleague infecting me with his cold man you guys got some colds over here <whistles> everybody got sick out here <laughs> Sorry, Andy, that you missed the gig, but uh, it's nice to always have you here, and thank you for the super chat. I do appreciate it, and I just took up. Oh, uh, what else we got here? Let's see. Uh, how often do you change guitar strings? On the road, on a guitar that I play a lot, like let's say I'm using it on you know 40% of the show or something, that's kind of a lot. Uh, I'll change them every... Uh, uh, Roger, my faithful tech, Roger, who I love deeply. Uh, he's so fantastic uh he uh probably every three gigs something like that i think he does if it's a guitar that you're only playing on a couple songs you know that you can go longer you know than that there's no you're just sort of wasting strings if you're only picking it up for five minutes a day and then you're changing them every few gigs so that doesn't really make sense but um but i i, I don't like breaking strings i don't want to break strings knock on wood please don't break strings so uh every few days and the bridges on my signature guitar you know, uh, the tremolo, I'll use it. And they do tend to break strings a little more because it's getting stressed, you know, and you're bending the string more. So um, so I, I tend to go through about three gigs, something like that. Now in the studio at home, I, I kind of hate changing strings, so I don't do it that much. And then I, when I break them, you know, it'll be every few weeks, I'll break one and then I'll, all right, it's time for a new set. And usually leading up to that, I'm like, one of these strings is probably going to break today. And these are sounding really dull. You should change them, you know, and then that finally leads me to do it once I bust one in the studio when I'm trying to play something or film something. Yeah. Uh, have you tried the Floyd Rose FRX for Les Paul? Is that a new type of Floyd Rose? I remember they used to have, I mean, back in the day, Floyd had a bridge that you could retrofit on a, on a Les Paul that kind of went around the tailpiece and stuff, and it was kind of interesting. Uh, but I don't rem I don't know this one. I haven't tried it, so sorry. Yeah, I can't really comment. Uh, awesome thumbnail of the EVH guitar. How do you find it compares to your other EVH style guitars? Um, once again, I'll tell the story of this guitar soon in its own, but I want to do it in its own dedicated video. So uh, I won't do it here now, but this is this EVH music man that has come my way. Um, I, the difference between the music man and the later ones, the necks are quite different on the newer Wolfgangs, I would say. Um, they're, they've gotten definitely like flatter radius and wider and the new ones seem to have big frets um which you know for a lot of years eddie used those tiny frets and so the the music man does have quite small frets and it seems to be probably a straight 12 radius if not 10. it's like it's quite radius the fingerboard on the music man and i think there might be finish on the fingerboard i gotta take a look again uh i might at least have a satin finish the back and neck is unfinished but um so that's a little different the neck is quite small, which people know about those. It's got it's fairly narrow and it's kind of a small round sort of feel to it. It's an interesting neck, but it's not uncomfortable. Um, that guitar is really beautiful. It's the one in the thumbnail for this video. It uh, it resonates like crazy. And Andy, the uh, uh, sound guy out here, he loves it. He's like, that guitar sounds so fat. Somebody commented the other day on one of our videos. They said that guitar does have like when you played it, it has a real thing to it. You know, so it's it's a very, very good sounding guitar. Stays in tune great with the, you know, the Floyd on it. And, uh, yeah, it's a cool guitar, you know. What's the largest audience you ever performed to? Uh, you know, I, I can't quite confirm, but there was supposed to be 140,000 at this gig I did in uh, Columbia once, Bogota. It was around 2003 or four. Um, it was the Rock Al Parque Festival. And uh, we closed it with a guy named Rocco Rosa that I was playing with, and um, 140. That's what I heard. Now I don't know if that that's that number could have been just like a number that was thrown around. There was a hundred thousand at the, at Fuji when I did the big gig with Yoshi Nagabuchi in 2015. So that's the biggest I can confirm. Uh, you know, that was a hundred k people, and that was a 
craziest show I've ever done an all night concert from 9 30 PM to like it's almost seven in the morning where we played four sets and played all night on this massive, the biggest stage ever built in Japan. It was like this, that's the craziest gig I've ever done. So let's say that one just because it was the craziest. And how did it feel? It felt, um, God, man, I almost having a nervous breakdown after that gig, to be honest. Uh, it was surreal. There was a lot going on in my life at that time too, when I did that gig. So I think I was just kind of like generally like stressed, but it was a cathartic gig, incredible gig musically. Um, and so much fun and just, you know, it was one of those moments in life, like maybe that never happens again, anything like that. And so I was trying my best to be present and, uh, and do it and really appreciate it when it happened. It's hard because it's like you're working and then at the same time you're, you know, you're working, you're trying to remember parts. Oh yeah. What's my effects changes for this song? What guitar do I know, check your tuning. And then at the same time, you're trying to go, this is a moment in life that'll probably like, this is really, really unique. And like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen again. So you're just trying to get into it and really like, you know, being in a foreign country and playing foreign music with a guy singing basically in Japanese a hundred percent and all these people there. And yet we're there and it's like, yeah, this is totally bizarre right now and completely interesting and kind of what I got into it for, you know? So that's how I felt, you know, it's a, it's a lot of feelings actually at once, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a little overwhelming and then you kind of have to sort of decompress and then think about it later, uh, you know, to go, that was uh, a lot, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to comprehend and, you just don't want to, I, I find, you know, there's a lot of gigs um, now that I'll see videos of, for instance, when I was playing with Chris Cornell and I'll see video of it and I'm like, that's me, but I don't remember, you know, I don't remember being there. They just kind of went like, you know, we played a lot of shows in that band. We did over 300 gigs, I think, um, in the time that I played. And, and a lot of them just, I wish I'd been more you know, you can't, it's like, that's the one thing I would recommend to other younger musicians. If you get a cool gig or your band takes off or things are going on, try and be present, like try and remember to go, this might not always last, you know? And so try and like be really, cause you only get one life. And it's just like, if you can, I remember being really present at a few of them and those are magic. Like the ones where certain things would happen where you're just like, this is so cool right now. All the audience singing a song back to you or, uh, just special moments, you know, where like you were tuned in. And for some reason, I remember these specific ones. You know, I remember the concert that we did in Chile in 2007 as being so special uh, just because the crowd was so magic. And we had so much fun that night for whatever reason. It was hot as hell in there. And everybody was like, it was just a sweaty, cathartic gig. And there was about 10,000 people there, which was a lot for a, a Chris solo show. Um, and another one in Israel in 2009 was special because everybody sang every word to every song and that was like his solo songs you know the, they were you know popular people knew them songs from euphoria morning and you know stuff but in israel they sang them like they were hits back and they were so loud the crowd singing all this and it was like you really got the sense like uh when you go to a place like that sometimes that not a lot of bands get to sometimes to play shows and you get this sense like people really appreciate you being there that you made it all that way and they want to have fun and they're like you know ready to to have a good time and ready to you know and maybe he'd never played there before probably not it, when we did that gig in chile he'd never been there so what with soundgarden and audio slave any of his bands he'd never made it there to, to tour um this was the first time these people saw him was uh, was with us and so that was like okay they were just like if you were a Soundgarden fan growing up or a audio slave fan or a Chris Cornell fan, this was like magic. There he was, he's in front of you. It's like that magic rock concert thing for the first time that they, so that those gigs are, uh, you, you, those are magic feeling, you know, cause there's just an energy in the room that is like, it's so much fun. It's feeling present is how you feel. You know, you're present in the moment and you're like aware of that's the, my favorite feeling on stage. When everything's going good, it sounds good. Everybody's having a good time, and you can tell the band's having fun, the crowd's having fun, and it's this magic thing that you're all having fun together. That's what's supposed to happen at shows, you know. And when you when it it doesn't always, yeah, but when you achieve it, it's it's uh, you just feel like you're living, you know. It's really cool. Uh, Vibas, what's up? Wanted to. Um, 
Uh, say thanks again for recommending the Wilkinson Locking Saddles. They're a godsend. Awesome. Sorted out your tuning issues. Excellent. Yeah, they're really good. They are really good. Uh, I'd like to see a new modeling asset that can load captures instead of just amp model simulations, maybe at NAM. Um, I don't know. Good question. Uh, that can load captures. I mean, I guess a neural should come out with something like that, but everybody's going so direct these days, you know. Uh, but I don't know if there's, you know, it's not something that I know of happening. Uh, it's an interesting idea, though, you know, for sure. You can you can do it now. I mean, it's just you can't do it in all in one thing. I mean, I did it on tour, right, with the quad and running into a, a power amp, a matrix power amp, or on fly dates, it's a little Seymour Duncan, you know. Uh, you know, a great... A great sounding power amp that has some of the characteristics of tubes or whatever, you know, plugged into a, a nice cabinet packaged with a modeler. Yeah, like that would be a cool thing where you can load captures and stuff for sure. Yeah. Uh, super chats here. John, what's up, man? How you doing? Glad you're coming home soon. Me too, man. Ready for some home time. What's the difference between Wilkinson Bridge that comes on your SIG these days and the 510 that's on your old SIG? Uh, the, besides the locking saddles, not much, really just the locking saddles. Um, yeah, really just the lock saddles is all is, is the, you know, tonally, uh, I've got a couple different versions of that Wilkinson or sorry of the Godo bridge on different guitars. I've got a six screw version and you get the two post version. I've got vintage saddles. I got block saddles. I would say the block saddles sound a little bit more airy or maybe you get other harmonics out of them. They're kind of more vintage sounding. Um, the, sorry, that's the bent saddles, the vintage style, like you see on a 57 Strat or whatever, right? Um, the block saddles, like you see on a Godo 510 more modern, maybe a little more fundamental note. They sound a little more like that, like a little more, it's, it's a little less airy stratty and a little more modern sort of fundamental note. Does that make sense? That's just my, you know, off the top of my head. That's what I think. The, Wilkinson saddles, for some reason, kind of sound the best to me, um, which was something unexpected about them. And I mean, the, the, the advantage to them is supposed to be the tuning thing. But when I put them on uh, guitars, they tended to, the, is like, am I crazy? Or does the whole guitar sound a little louder and just more resonant and a little more live? Like, so I really like the way they sound. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so there's that about the saddles, but also they lock and then you stay in tune better. So, yeah. Okay. What else we got here? Let's see. I'm going to hang for another 10 minutes or so, you guys, and then I'm going to go eat dinner, I think. Maybe 10, maybe 15. 15 minutes. And then I'll split and get some food. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh, somebody saying the police were pops says naive Steve. Well, the police were the police to me, you know, somebody said the police were po post punk, you know, you could also say the police were new wave. You could also say, but they had the reggae influences. They're not reggae band, but they had reggae influences. So to me, the police were the police. They were their own genre. You know, they didn't really sound like, like it's, I know it's our human nature to want to classify things and put a label on them, but it's really difficult because they were such a unique sounding band that probably nobody knew what to do with them when they came out. They were just cool, you know? Um, a little like, I don't know, like what's another great example um, of another band that sounded so unique, you know? What do you call U2, actually? Like for a kind of a commercial band. They sound like them, you know? Um, it's like, you know, when you try and pigeonhole some of these bands, they just, they had a, like to me, the Pretenders are definitely a rock band, but some people say no, you know? Um, what about Billy Idol? Is he New Wave? It's a combination of, you know, when you get Billy, who is a punk, you know, uh, and then you put them together with somebody like Stevens and then the producer, you know, uh, you know, Steve, I mean, he had, uh, you know, he loved Led Zeppelin and Eddie Van Halen and, uh, but he also really loved King Crimson and yes, you know, so put all that together and you, you get a very, very interesting combo. That's very difficult to put a label on, I find, you know, 
Uh, so we've had a lot of this discussion out here on the road. What with the Brits? What is classic rock? Uh, all right. Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. I'm, I think I'm really far back in the chat. Who is Andy Summers is 80, says Naive Steve. Is he really? Is he that? Yeah. I know he was the oldest member of the police, right? And he was, you know, significantly older than than the other guys, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, Simto says, uh, I saw the police's last gig in the UK in 2008. Really sad a band that plays so well together. Can't keep playing together because of bickering. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's cool they came back and did that one tour, though. And, um, you know, that's neat. I, I never saw them on that tour. I did see them on the Synchronicity tour. When I was with Cornell, we missed them by one day in Sweden. They were playing the following day from us at the venue next to us. So that I actually walked, I was able to go in the venue and see the stage set up and everything. We were getting set up the day before. It was like a big stadium gig. We were playing the arena kind of gig next door, theater arena thing. And so we played and then we had to leave the next day and they were playing there. So I never got to see it, but I did see them on the synchronicity tour, which was really cool. Um, yeah. Uh, Lamar Brewster says, does playing in a control room or studio versus live change how you play since your cabs are isolated? Yeah, but I'm so used to it now, to be honest. Um, yeah. Um, it, you know, you just get used to playing through monitors and then, you know, if you need feedback, you turn them way up, which is, never quite the same but or you you know use your jack freak out pedal pedal <laughs> but it's a much easier thing to record in a in the control room you know and most people do it you know uh paul makes an interesting point this is 100 percent true if you said post-punk when the police were uh, about no one would know what you meant no one used the term that's absolutely true we didn't that was a, that was a, something people made up later you know so um yeah you know we, we didn't think about it that much we just went that's cool. I like that. Or, or I don't like that. You know, it's kind of how we did it. I, I like this discussion. So many comments. and I'm sorry I'm missing like a ton of them, but uh, uh, it's, it's been a, a fun one as always. Edbert says uh, with a super chat. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for the Sunday live. As always, I've been practicing with Iridium using headphone out, but facing ear fatigue. Any advice? You know, it's funny. Um, when you play through things only with earphones, you tend to turn it up kind of louder than you probably should. And it's like, cause you can't feel it in your body. You know, it's not like, so, you know, only having it right here, which is the kind of the, the thing about any of your monitors sensing as much volume, you know, you can tend to pummel your ears a little bit and then you get used to that really quick. And it's like, yeah, that sounds good. And then after half an hour, you're like, why are my ears ringing? You know? Um, so you just have to be a little more careful because without the, without something stuck in your ear only, if you can't sense it coming in your, you know, I don't know, something about like playing an amp or hearing a PA or whatever, and not having things stuck right on your eardrums, uh, you feel, you, you sense the volume more. Does that make sense? You know, uh, like the, you know, the, so you'd probably be surprised if you were to, uh, you know, if you had a decibel meter and you could somehow measure what was coming out of your in-ears or headphones, uh, going right into your ears, it would probably be higher than you think it is, you know? Um, and it's right there on your eardrums. So, the only answer is you kind of got to turn down, you know, so go a little lower than you feel like not as much fun, maybe, but if you're sensing that you're hurting your ears or that you're getting fatigued, kind of know there's no free lunch, right? You got to just kind of turn it down a little bit for as much as I love loud amps and stuff. Um, I don't really love loud stages these days. Like as much as I love, I shouldn't say loud amps. I just like a real lamp on stage and I like it to be kicking, but I, I don't really like it to be ridiculous. Like um, I don't like too much volume, you know, I don't like standing right beside drums, for instance, you know, like I, I, I'm happy on this tour to be far stage left and the drums are actually far stage right. They're not center because I'm far enough away from the snare drum where I can hear it perfectly, but it's not right behind me. Cymbals and snare drums and stuff to me are very like, I can't, I don't like standing right next to them. Not even for, you know, I'll do it uh, on the gig for, cause I like to go rock with Tim, the drummer, but he's a hard hitter and stuff. And I don't like being there for very long. Not cause I don't like his drumming just cause I don't like the volume, <laughs> you know, it's really loud to me. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ralph says, um, I contacted ARM to get a spare set of tubes for my PT-15. I gave them the numbers that Sir wrote on the tubes. They told me those don't, numbers don't cross over to any ratings they used. Yeah, you kind of need to talk to Sir 
directly about it. And I don't know if they will be able to get you the tubes, you know, exactly like with the numbers and stuff, but um, you can ask them anyway, you can contact customer service and ask them um, and see if they can help you out. It's worth an email at cs at sir.com. Uh, like the letter C, letter S at sir.com. Ask them and see. Um, they do their own way of, you know, two different measurements of milliamps and something else, you know, that, uh, you know, and they they can tell you, you know, uh, when they match up or whatever. But uh, yeah, they probably won't have any idea what you're at. I think it's ARS that you're talking about, ARS tubes. Because uh, they, they, they actually match and measure them and, you know, do more testing and stuff at Sir after they buy them. Heard the new solo, Nuno solo on the new song. Thanks for the, uh, it's just such a, so many people have asked me this today. I have, Doug, and thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. I have, he's ripping. It's good to hear him rip. We were talking about, I was saying, using that delay trick that, he, that you have heard him use on like Flight of the Bumblebee and stuff before, but it's super cool. And he sounds great. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's your favorite coolest guitar you've ever played? Any brand style you're, mm, it's too hard to pick, man. My favorite guitar that I've ever played. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I love my current, I know this is, sounds like broken record or whatever, but I love my current Sir signature model. Cause I could probably do my whole rest of my career on that guitar. I mean, it does everything I need it to do and it's a beautiful guitar and you know, i see these things as tools. So have that said, uh, my special guitars, I mean, I have my old Strat, I love very much. My 64, my 335, I love very much. Every time I pick up the Gil Yaren guitar after not having played it for a while, my replica of a 59, I'm always like, ah, oh, feels like an old pair of shoes, like an old friend. I spent a lot of time with that guitar. So there's a few. Uh, yeah. Uh, huh, uh, huh. Wow, I'm far back in the chat. The super chats. I got to get to all the super chats here. And uh, if an amp, cabs, mics, pre's, etc., is 10 out of 10. Oh, I did this one already. Um, sorry if I modern vintage, if I hadn't, if I was so far back in the chat that you asked again and then sent another one. But uh, yeah, we went over this already. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I hope, I hope you were here still for that, for the answer and not frustrated with me. Um, Scott says, JHS has gotten too silly. I missed the serious episodes with history. They did it. Uh, they, you know, it's hard guys doing YouTube because it's like, I mean, I run into this. I mean, where it's like, you know, what are we going to talk about now? We've talked about so much guitar stuff. I mean, thankfully on this show, you guys are here and you ask me questions and then it helps prod me, you know. But if I have to come up with my own topics for videos, it can be hard after you've done like six or 700 videos. <laughs> what am I going to talk about now about guitar? You know, it's just how it is, you know. But it, seemingly there's always more, you know. So you just have to dig for it a little bit. Any possibility of you putting OD100 classic sound on a voice and switch into PT50? No, not really. Um, I'll do my own thing. But what I do, what I do want to do in a PT50, and I've mentioned this before, is really nail the plexi thing. I want a true plexi channel with some switchable, like I want some switchable gain options in the amp and I want some switchable bright options in the amp uh and yeah that's really important to me so that's what i'm going for love to just get a great 50 watt plexi thing going in there uh it, not that you can't get close like on the current you know pd100 stuff but i i want to be, actually be like switching gain stages and stuff you know be able to to do that stuff so that's where i'm at how do i use a fuzz i use them on see them on guys boards with great tone but i can't get past the busted speaker sound well, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I think it, we we covered this already, but I would suggest for you, honestly, the Crazy Tube Circuits uh, Starlight. That's the one I'm going to recommend to you give a try, and I think you'll probably like it. It's very, very easy to use with different amplifiers, wide wide range of gain, wide range on the tone control, and it's the fuzz for people that don't like fuzz or understand it. That's what I always say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Richard says he's going to see Alter Bridge and Mammoth on tour soon in Seattle. Uh, I'd like to see that tour actually. I might see if I can go to that because I think they're playing Anaheim soon, so we'll see. But um, I might see if I can if I can hang at that show and, and check it out. I saw Mammoth a little while ago uh, on tour with was it with the Dirty Honey? Was that the band? I think I think so. 
uh, at the Wiltern, which was fun. Um, yeah, and I would like to see them now. Uh, I'm so far down in, or so far off in the chat. So sorry, I got to grab these super chats and then I got to run because I got a dinner, a little dinner reservation. What do I think of Nick Johnson and his SIG guitar? I know people like that guitar. Uh, that's from Paul. Thanks, Paul. Um, I don't know anything about the guitar, but Nick is a nice guy. I, I met him at, uh, and he's a great guitar player. I met him at, um, uh, uh, GitCon a number of years ago, probably going on four or five years ago now. He was there, uh, when I was there and he, he seemed like a nice chap. And I know he's a really good player. Um, Canadian, I think, right? Is my If my memory serves correct. Fender1960 says, good afternoon. I picked up the Sir PT15IR this weekend. Awesome. Using it with the Sin 1 and my modules with Halo and Loop. Great, great setup. That's cool. That's a unique rig. I like it. Do different things with it, you know? Yeah, then you can get some different sounds, like maybe use the Morgan Vox module with it or something. I bet it sounds really cool, you know, with the Sin 1. Uh, getting some different things, you know, or uh, or the the Savage or something, right? That's another one I really like for like the angle module for for metal, you know, give you some different different sounds. That's awesome. Um, Robert says I've done a few gigs in warehouses with high ceilings and was talking to a friend who has done the same. Our experience is the acoustics always seem to be great. Uh well, high ceiling, a low ceiling is weird sometimes for things like you know just the way bass develops and stuff. And it, the higher the ceiling gets, the more you're going to get a reverb out of the room because it's not completely open. So the sound's not going to go out into the ether like it would in an open field. Um, but you're not going to have the, the more volume you have in a room. I don't mean volume like turning up. I mean like space, uh, you, you know, with a roof and things, the less you're going to get those kinds of, you know, weird reflections and buildups. And, uh, you know, uh, space is your friend when it comes to rooms, I think on high ceilings, probably your friend when it comes to rooms, when it comes to wanting to avoid uh, weird lows, weird mids, um, you know, and if the room's really long, like, you know, odd shapes too, you know, with is helpful, you know, for not having slap back and stuff. So um, that's all, you know, I just think the lower the ceiling gets, the more you get your boxing in, whatever you're kicking into the room and then getting frequency build up and stuff and any kind of parallel surfaces, walls, roofs, floors, tend to accentuate that it's just physics of the way the sound comes out and builds up in certain frequencies and gets weird the higher the ceiling the less that's going to be a factor so it's probably got something to do with that you know you'll you'll just get a nice big old reverb tail uh without too much frequency build up or cloudy weird low mids or low end uh what treble booster for an ac30 mid 60s jmi non-top boost use full range boosters like mamax or microamp yeah that's not gonna work um you could use a uh i mean my favorite but you can't really they're hard to find a color booster from 65 amps is really nice treble booster um the dyna ranger from divided by 13 that's another one uh the isn't there one from Catlin bread called the Naga Viper or something. Um, there's stuff from other companies like uh, Throw Throwback. I think they make one. The company that makes the pickups. Um, uh, just look for any Range Master that you can find. You know, find, uh, Range Master is a simple circuit, so they all kind of do a cool thing. Um, they can voice them a little differently. Some of them have a knob on them that lets you kind of cut bass more or add more in to the circuit. So where the bass gets cut off. Um, the, the Cornish one is really interesting. It's super expensive, like $600, uh, uh, but it sounds really cool. It's a fatter sort of, uh, take on the range master. Um, the 60, uh, sorry, the, uh, unit 67 that I use on my pedal board has a range master style boost in it. I don't find it to be as aggressive. That's from dry bell. I don't find it to be aggressive as aggressive as a real range master, but it does that thing. And it works with buffers. So it's a little more flexible than a range master. It's a range master style boost. So, you know, um, but yeah, what you really want is a range master. So that's the sound, man. Into a, into a, it's magic. Into a normal channel of an AC30, it's so cool. It just does that thing, Roy Gallagher, Brian May. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. So there's quite a few of them out there, though. So look for whatever Brian uses. There's a guy that makes, is it Fryer? I think it's Fryer, F-R-Y-E-R. -E he makes some 
look up his name and look for his treble booster. If you get the Brian Mimi one, it doesn't even have a knob in it, I don't think. It's like there's no pot to adjust it. It's just on and off. Uh, or maybe it's just on. There might not be a switch. <laughs> you plug into the box and it's always on, I think. That's the Brian one. But then he makes versions that have a switch or a pot and all that. So you can adjust the effect. Just the purity of the always on treble booster. Am I going to Nam? I am going to Nam. Yeah. Uh, I am going to be there. So yeah, we'll see what it's like this year. We'll see as we move into next year when it goes back to January, how many people come back. I think PRS is going this year, I heard. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Yamaha Line 6 will be there. Um, uh, I'm not sure. There was maybe another company I heard was going to be there, a bigger one. Ibanez was there last year, you know. They decided to go, I think, sort of last minute. I don't know if it was totally last minute or not, but I heard they weren't going to be there, and then they were. I was like, oh, surprised. Here they are, you know. So um, Taylor was there last year. I think they'll be there again. Uh, so let's see what happens, you know, over the next year or two. I would say that it's never going to probably go back to being what it quite was. But last year, NAM show was fun. It felt like half the vendors with about 70% of the traffic. There was a lot of people there. And the air that kind of gets sucked out of the room by the big guys, you know, the not that there's anything wrong with them, but, you know, the vendors and the Gibsons and all that stuff. That got instead, you know, because folks went. There was a lot, fair amount of people there. The, some of the smaller vendors that decided to go uh, were able to absorb some of that, you know, and probably get a little bit more. So it was, it was good, you know, in a way. And I, I felt like a, when I left, I was like, yeah, that was basically the NAMM show, you know, felt like that was the experience. If you like going to it or if you enjoy the camaraderie, a lot of people hate it or they say they hate it. Uh, if you work for companies, I can understand why you would say that, you know, or if you're a snobby LA musician. So you're going to go to the NAMM show. I'm not going to go to the NAMM show. Mm -hmm. So in the parking. There's so many people. The food's so expensive. <laughs> I I always say this, you know, but I remember Josh Smith one year going, I love the NAMM show. I go every year. It's full of guitars. All my friends are there. It's great. I go all four days <laughs> or however many days it is, you know. I was like, that's a guy with a good attitude. I like it. Uh, uh, oh, God, I really got to go here pretty quick. But... um. Gone to the unseen. Could one use the quad cortex with Fryat power station and two cabs for a stereo rig? Uh, quad cortex with Fryat power station and two cabs. Well, there's no, it's not a stereo amp. So you would need two power stations. It's only a mono tube power amp. So right there, you're new. But you could go mono with the quad cortex. Uh, if you use two power stations, you could. But see, that's a little overkill. You Really what you want is a power amp, you know? That's why I use the quad with a matrix. You know, if you can find a good, like something like a Rocktron Velocity or uh, some some guitar power amp with damping that was designed for for guitar, um, you can use that with a quad. You don't have to use a tube amp with it because you've already got tube amps built in, right? The the characteristics are sort of supposed to be in there of with, especially if you do a capture and all that. It's already got all the the kind of the stuff built in. Now you just want a guitar power amp that doesn't kind of screw that up, you know, and it should sound pretty good. So. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, ever tried the CM board Duncan? Whole lot of humbucker. I have not, I haven't tried that one. Uh, there's a big old super chat. Thank you very much, guitars, for your project. Appreciate that. What's the best way to do multiple amps in quad cortex without audible dropout when changing patches? Uh, a clean twin to Marshall, Kemper, and Headrush can do this in preset mode. Quad can't, uh, e well. You can, um, you yeah, you can. You you just have to do uh, uh, scenes. So in other words, in you you have to have a scene. So a scene is sort of like in, in the uh, snapshot mode on a helix, right? It's the same. So you've loaded up a preset, and then within that preset, you want to turn things on and off, right? Much like you would on a pedal board, or you got different amps loaded or different routing. Now you can do all that in a quad. Um, You've got four processors and you've got four distinct audio paths there and stuff. And you can uh, organize and arrange things in any way that you want. So uh, it's scene mode. You know, you basically got stomp mode, preset mode, scene mode on a quad cortex. And seed, scene mode is the one that you want for no, uh, for spillover, when you want spillover and stuff. Your preset mode, yes, there's a slight gap when you change presets because it's loading up a new one and it's, you get the cutoff. But in scene mode, you can generally get what you want. You're saying multiple amps 
a clean twin to Marshall. That's no problem. I mean, that's a pretty common in the, in the quad to be able to do, you know, I do it all the time, actually. I mean, in the, you know, with some different presets that I've had where I've got my clean sound and my dirty sound and one amp turns off and the other one turns on. And even with a different cab sim and stuff, if you want, uh, not, a, not a big deal. Scenes. Look into scenes. Are you part of a scene? What scene are you into? Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, man, I hope I... I'm so far back and I hope I don't miss you guys send me super chats and stuff and i do appreciate it we're missing doug uh did you ever tweak the frequency pot inside your bogner blue no i didn't even know there was one there to be honest see i don't know everything i barely know anything uh i i, I didn't uh didn't ever tweak it good sounding pedal though great sounding marshall in the box uh why not just play quad cortex into a power amp? yep exactly quad cortex into power and that's all you need to do just to Oh, it was my rig on the last tour. I used a Matrix 1500 into two 112s, and it worked great. Travis, there with a super chat. Of all the signature equipment you've had and used throughout the years, what has been your favorite combo? Uh, I mean, I would love the, you know, like, to be honest, I mean, I could do everything that I ever need to do with, a, like, a PT100 and a, my signature guitar. That's what, because we designed them to be like, okay, what do I want? You know, so it's all in there. Sometimes I just mess around with other stuff. Like I'm using the SL68 and the Bella on this tour. But now I'm thinking like right now, I'm like, you know what? Like if I did this again, probably just one 412 and PT100. <laughs> That's what I was feeling today. You know, I'm already ready to try something else. So it's like, uh, but, th but then I'm thinking, you know, we're going to finish a new amp one of these days, PT50. And it'll be that, you know, let's do PT50. And, you know, one thing I really like doing that I will say, though, that I would love to try again is maybe an open back cab and a closed back cab at the same time. And I used to do that. I used to do a 412 and an open back 212. And I was running all six speakers at once. And that was really cool because you got everything. You had the one thing I love about an open back on stage is the air when you're on cleaner sounds. It's just great, you know. So I kind of. You know, that would be cool. If there would be a, <coughs> a way I could switch cabinets, that would be so cool. But no, nobody makes an amp that, um, Bogner did that on one version of the Ecstasy, but it evidently was kind of like, it's a little risky and dangerous. I think the way that um, when, you're, when you're switching speaker cabinets on a channel switching amp, there was a, that was the only one I think that was ever made that did that. So you go from the clean channel to the distortion channels and you could actually switch cabs. It's a little risky, evidently, from what I've been told, but kind of cool. And then they didn't do it anymore. So there's always a reason why they stopped doing that. Uh huh. Uh, oh, two more teas, you guys, with your. I appreciate these super chats. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, always a better Sunday with your show here. Hit the like, liking, no videos this week, and a bunch when you're back. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, I know I told you I was going to put out that amp or uh, sorry, amp. What's it called? Amp two from the from Black Star. The, you know, the red pedal that's got the effects built in and amp sounds and cab sounds and the whole nine yards. Uh, that, it, it didn't come out this week because they asked me to put it out next week. So uh, that'll be coming at the, uh, some point this week. I'll put that out. Probably try and finish it up maybe tomorrow and then upload it. And maybe, maybe it'll come out on Wednesday or something when I'm on the plane on the way home. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for the super chat. Music Life with Arthur. What's up, man? Here's something to keep you in the caffeine when you're out there in the world. You're the best. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'll be buying some beans when I get home. I need to get some more capsules from my Nespresso Verturo. That's my home machine. <laughs> the lovely Nespresso. No, I love it. It's great. Uh, do drummers wear earplugs? Some of them, if they're smart, yeah, they probably do. Uh, cymbals are ear ice picks. 100% they are. Yeah, cymbals are the devil. They will make you go deaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh wow so many great comments today the chat is super active and i still got 350 people online but i do have to run because i got to get some dinner uh getting late over here and it's a sunday so places close early so i'm gonna grab some some food but this has been so much fun uh yeah uh shade hope says super glue fund <laughs> how's your finger holding up good no problems um yeah, since that split. You know, uh, poor James, he split his finger uh, a couple weeks after me. And uh, he had the exact same thing. Third finger split. Trying to play a Freebird solo with that is really interesting. Regarding my super chat, 
scenes in quad, do you put amps all on the first line and just bypass the ones you want to use and not use? That's one way you can do it. Sure. Effects and cabs on the next line. Yeah, you could do that. Um, yeah, sure. Just by, yeah, do that. Like literally have, you know, I mean, you can, or if you want to put some pedal effects, you know, but the whole thing is you can do different routings and stuff. Like, so you could, you could have like different pedal effects in two different rows in front of two different amps, you know, and then just switch the input between them. Like there's ways to do stuff like that, the routing. And um, so the kind of the Scott, you can design the rig the way that you want, but yeah, the easiest, say you want to use three or three pedal effects or something in front of your amps, put all those in one, two, three, and then put an amp block at another amp block. Right. And then go down to the next row. And there you can go to some post effects and maybe a couple of cabs, whatever you want. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's exactly what you would do is in each scene, you would program the scenes to have amp one or amp two turning on and off and it's instantaneous and it works great. Yeah. I kind of did that with, uh, it's exactly what I was doing to be honest on the, um, I did it with captures though, not amp models, but on, on the, uh, the show we did in Malta with the classic rock show last summer, I had all three channels of the PT 15, um, captured because that was the amp that I was using on the last year's tour. I just thought, well, I'll just replicate my rig. So I did the clean channel, channel two, channel three, all in captures that I made myself in my studio using the head and the load box. And then I would just have each of those amps come on within a scene. Now each song was a preset. Right. So my presets were songs. And then each scene was if I needed to go from clean to dirty to solo or whatever, the different amp things would come on and off. So it was super easy. And I just did it. I just did song presets, basically. We probably did 18 songs, 20 songs in the set. I did a preset for absolutely every song. You don't have to do that, but that's the way I did it. You could do just a simple rig that has clean and dirty scenes in it. You can have up to eight, right? Per, uh, uh, you know, and that should be enough for any song or any, you know, so that if, if what you're trying to achieve is no gap, you want spillover, delays, reverbs, all that stuff, no problem. You know, it'll, it'll do it seamlessly. So where I'd be right now, I am in lovely Dartford, not far from London, essentially a suburb. Uh, and uh, that's it. We play uh, Dartford tomorrow and then we do a, a place called the Orchard Theatre. Please come see us if you're in the general vicinity. And then we do Cadogan Hall uh, in Sloan Square, kind of Kensington uh, area in London. One more show, one more final London show. Kind of cool to come back to London for a show. Um, this feels good. I don't know. It's a nice place to play and stuff. And it's a nice sort of small, medium theater in London. We did two nights there already, and then they added a third. So maybe next year when I come back and do this thing, we'll play a bigger London venue, <laughs> I think. Because at this point, three nights in the same venue, it's like, okay, let's do Shepherd Bush Empire or Royal Albert Hall or something, maybe. Who knows, you know? It'd be interesting. It's a bit of a risk. You go into a new place, you know, you move from a 1,300-seater or whatever into, a, say, 4,500 or something like that, right? But what if you can go three quarters full on a place like that and do, you know what I mean? And then one night, you know, so we'll see, we'll see what happens with it. It's interesting, but maybe next time, different, different venue, maybe not, but maybe we'll see. Last little comment here. Since Tralia said, I bought an API 3122 preamp. You're right. They rock. They do for guitar API rock and roll. All right, you guys. Um, this has been awesome. Two hours we went today. Next week, I'll be back in my studio on Sunday at the usual time. And it'll be great to be back there. And we'll see you there. And uh, I'll fire up the coffee and who knows, maybe fire up the amps and uh, do, the, do the thing where I'm actually able to play a little bit and stuff. That's been fun on the, on the chats recently. But I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much for the super chats. I'm sorry. I know I missed a ton of uh, comments and questions and stuff. Just amazing you all turn up every week. And I'm very happy to have you here. So... Take care, and uh, I wish you well, and I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.